Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're delighted that the snow decided to take a holiday. It was uh, nice while it lasted, I guess, a, a slight uh, variation from our norm, especially over on the west side of the state. But uh, it's a nice day out today, so we're, we're delighted to have that. So welcome all to the spring 2013 Battenfield Carletti Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. My name is Dr. Bill Rugg. I am the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at NSU. I came here about six months ago, for those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet. I uh, hope to do that sometime very soon. This is the 11th year of these lectures, which were established through the NSU Foundation by Dr. Har Harold Bettenfield, a retired orthopedic surgeon in Tulsa, and Dr. John Carletti, a practicing dentist in Sepulpa. Dr. Battenfield is a lifelong learner and is actually in class today in Tulsa. We're delighted about that. Um, and so he could not join us because he's being a good student. Dr. Carletti is unable to, to attend due to health reasons. However, we're thrilled to have their spouses, Mary Battenfield and Janice Carletti, with, join us today. Ladies. <clears throat> Mary and Janice, we're so glad that you could come and join us for this event. So thank you for being here and welcome back to NSU. On the back of your program is a list of past entrepreneur lecture uh, recipients. And today we actually have two of those uh, recipients with us. That is Brad and Karen Baus. <clears throat> They spoke uh, the year before last, actually, about uh, their Charlie's Chickens franchises. So I know many of you, especially the students, are frequenting our uh, local Charlie Chickens franchise. We're delighted to have the, the grand reopening, uh, what, about a year ago, I think, right? So we, we appreciate you, and I'm sure you appreciate uh, all of our uh, students and faculty and staff coming in to visit you. So thank you for your service to our community. Uh, to, to introduce today's speaker, uh, I think a lot of you are very familiar with our, our guest today, but uh, we want to give you just a little bit of background. So I want to turn the mic over to Dr. Roger Collier, the Dean of our College of Business and Technology, to do the introduction. Thank you, Dr. Rugg. Before, before I get to the uh, introduction, a couple of things I want to make sure all of you students are aware of. Two things that you got when you came in. First, the blue sign-up sheet. If you're looking to get credit from your professors for being here, you need to fill out the sign-up sheet. There'll be people outside the door as you leave to take it from you, okay? The other thing is you also got a what looks kind of like a bookmark, and at the bottom of that bookmark on the white side is a number. That's your number for the drawing that'll happen later in the program today. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jimmy Houston, probably most of you have seen him on television. He's uh, now on uh, NBC Sports Outdoors, um, has been fishing and winning championships since he was a senior at NSU in 1966. Um, uh, on television, uh, inducted into any number of halls of fame, most recently the uh, Legends of the Outdoors Hall of Fame in 2008. He's written several books, the latest one, Catch of the Day, a 365-day daily devotional built around fishing, trip, fishing tips, tales, and events. And you don't want to hear me talk, you came to hear him talk, so I give you Jimmy Houston. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> I'm going to get out here a little, close, a little closer to everybody. Uh, you know, it's an honor to be here, and, and, and let me tell you, uh, I, I actually made me a little outline like I learned back in speech here at Northeastern back in the dark ages. I graduated from Northeastern right after statehood, and um, uh, it, uh, it was a great college then, it's a great college now, and the only reason y'all got to come and talk is because all the chicken I bought, y'all would probably not have been successful had I not eaten all that Charlie's chicken. Uh, when I was a kid, about 11 or 12 years old, I just happened to think of that when I saw that you were here. Uh, when I was a kid, about 11 or 12 years old, I worked three or four years on, a, on an egg farm. And, uh, and, and they, the guy had these big, giant hen houses and, and it had eggs. And we had to go in and gather eggs. And I, uh, I would candle the eggs and wash them and, and, and pack them in, in cases and dozen boxes and 
crate, big crate boxes and stuff, and, and I'd have to fight those chickens for eggs a lot of time. He had them in cages for a while, so when we'd go in there and gather them, we'd wear these big hook, hip boots, and we would walk in this really stinky stuff. You can figure out what it was underneath the chicken cages, and then he decided it was more wholesome to have eggs. I guess they got more money out of them. That, um, that, that came in actual nests, just like we have on the farm. And, uh, and so we did that. Then I'd have to go in and gather the eggs, and the chickens would be laying on, on, sitting on the eggs. You'd have to fight the chickens, and they would peck you. So I developed a real great hatred for eggs. I still to this day do not eat eggs, and I have a real hatred for chickens, so I eat them about three or four times a week. Still paying those chickens back from when I was 11 years old. And, and, and ironically, it's kind of amazing, uh, and, and uh, I, uh, I, we formed a, a, a brand here back last August uh, with myself and Bill Dance and Roland Martin, two other uh, great, great fishermen called the Three Legends, and we've signed licensing agreements with about 12 or 15 companies, and one of the companies we signed a licensing agreement with is called CCF, Country Creek Farms, and, uh, uh, and Country Creek Farms handles the egg department for Walmart. And so I've kind of come full circle from 10 or 11 or 12 years old back to working for a company that sells Walmart all their eggs. Anybody wonder how many eggs they, at Walmart buys? Anybody want to throw a guess out there? Come on, y'all. Just somebody throw a guess out there. A million. A million dozen? Somebody said a million a day. 350 million dozen eggs a year. That's right. Whoever said a million a day? A million dozen. That's 12 million eggs a day. That's what they buy. So, uh, so you know, I, I'm telling you, and there wasn't a Walmart around when that guy had that egg farm. There's no telling how many of those deals they had. Those chickens are staying busy so y'all can have breakfast. <laughs> and so you and I, we, I, 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 I get them after they get through laying. That's when I get them, you know. Uh, I, I, it is great to be here. I, all of that stuff right there, just kind of, uh, I, I, when I found out y'all were here, I, that all popped into my mind. Uh, listen, uh, I, I'm not going to talk about fishing shows and stuff. There are probably not very many people in here that will actually have the opportunity to fish for a living. It's a, it's a great, great thing. That, uh, and when I was in college here at Northeastern, um, it was a great deal when I graduated from high school where you had to go to school all day long and then you uh, spent the, all the evening in athletics. And, uh, I, and I got to fish a lot in high school. But when I came to college and found out you could get out of class at 12 and 1 o'clock in the day, and Lake Ten Killer sitting right down here. Woo! And the Illinois River. I sunk bass boats on the Illinois River. I actually sunk them. Do not float the Illinois River in a bass boat. You won't like the results. It doesn't work. But, uh, uh, but when I was in college, you know, and, and I worked like uh, 40 or 50 hours a week. I got married when I was a sophomore in college. My wife worked about 100 hours a week. And uh, that's why we stayed married for all these years. We've been married, I, I guess it'll be 50 years this year. Just shows you what a patient man I am, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. She might have something to do with that. I don't know. But, but uh, 50 years, the same woman. That's, that's pretty amazing. But, uh, but, uh, but she worked a lot harder when I was in college. And, but I could go fishing pretty much every day, and, and I did. But uh, and, and as things worked out throughout the years, you know, we were able to, uh, to, to make a career in fishing. And this is the 36th year that we've been on national television with Jimmy Houston Outdoors and our second show, Jimmy Houston Adventure, has been on, I don't really know how many, probably 12 or 15 years. Uh, we were on ESPN for 20 years. We still have the third longest running show uh, in the history of ESPN. We, we are on NBC Sports now and have been on uh, NBC Sports, I guess, for the last four or five years. Uh, we got kicked off of ESPN. We had a really highly rated show, but they just got out of the outdoor marketplace when they uh, bought half the rights to NASCAR in a seven-year package. And and they spent about $2 billion for that and decided to get that money back, they would run a lot of NASCAR stuff. And it was, uh, I'm a big NASCAR fan. A lot of the drivers are really good friends of mine. And uh, I was speaking to Tony Stewart just a couple of days ago. In fact, I, I might be one of the few people that know where Tony is right now. Tony's uh, in an airboat uh, in, uh, in Florida, fish with Johnny Morris, the guy that owns Bass Pro Shop. I, I set the trip up for him when I was down there the other day. So that, that's, that's what they're doing now. But, uh, it was real funny because ESPN, when we were on there, always made fun of race car drivers. They called them non-athletes, a bunch of rednecks out there, and all he had to do was just keep the pedal to the metal and make left turns all day. They weren't athletes. Until the Disney Corporation spent $2.2 billion buying the right to 50% of NASCAR for seven years. 
they decided those guys were really great athletes all of a sudden. <laughs> and uh, so they turned a lot of the, the, well, they turned all of their outdoor programming into and, uh, things around NASCAR. So uh, they kicked us off of there, and so we went over on NBC Sports. But 36 years we've been doing that outdoor show, which is a long, long time. And uh, in thinking about starting businesses and being an entrepreneur and, and starting something that you do yourself, and, and quite honestly, I've never really worked for a company. I've never worked for anybody. I, uh, when I graduated from Northeastern uh, back in 1966, I, I have a degree in political science. I have a degree in economics. And uh, I got the degree in political science because I intended to go to the Oklahoma University Law School. And I did it for no other reason than I looked around and saw who was making money, and it was the, it was the dang lawyers. And, <laughs> and I thought, well, they're making a lot of money. I need to be a lawyer. So I got that political science degree, and I got the economics degree just in case I was not able to, to, to be a lawyer, and I could use the economics degree to, uh, to go to work for somebody and, uh, and make a living. And uh, God saved me from being a lawyer. He saved the rest of the world, too, you know. <laughs> Because one less lawyer is a good deal. I'm telling you that for a fact. One less lawyer is good, you know. And, uh, I, and I don't have any regrets about what we've done for a living. But, but when, we, when I graduated from college, uh, the best job opportunity I had was with Phillips 66 up in Bartlesville. In, 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 uh, and it was a great job offer. But the only problem was I had to move to Bartlesville, which means that I couldn't live on Lake Tenkiller. And my, my love and passion for fishing, I, I thought, well, so, so I did the easiest job in the world. I started selling insurance for a living. And, uh, and I, I life insurance, of all things, you know, for a living. That was just a piece of cake, you know. Just, uh, and, and uh, you know, I was used to working in college 50 or 60 hours a week. And my wife was working about 80 to 100 hours a week. And we were making, back in those days, uh, I almost hate to tell you this, but like 75 cents and a dollar an hour. That's what we were making. But, you know, we had a car. We had a boat. We had a place to live. We had plenty to eat. I mean, we did great. And then I graduated from college with this great college degree, and, uh, and, and I went to sell an insurance and, and nearly starved to death about the first six months. And then I kind of got that figured out. You know, one of the things that, uh, that we've always tried to do in our life is figure out how to operate and, and, and do things correctly. And, and uh, when I first got to Northeastern, I nearly, I nearly failed uh, my first semester here. I don't know if anybody has then gone back and looked at any of the transcripts of some of those that went to school here, but... My first semester, it was, it was wonderful. I mean, all of a sudden, I, I got to do what I want. I got out of college, 11 or 12 o'clock, and I could go fishing. And, and, and I'd made really, really good grades in high school. And all of a sudden, I, I just about, and I looked at the grades I was going to have, and I thought, oh, my gosh, my daddy's going to kill me. I won't have to worry about failing out of college. I'll be dead, you know. And so I really worked real hard right at the end of the semester to kind of bring some of those grades up to a C. And my dad had never seen a C on a report card. Uh, on mine, he'd seen them on my sister's, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he had never seen that, you know, hardly had ever seen a B, and all of a sudden, I, he said, and, and you know, and I told him, I said, Dad, I understand, but you know, I got this, I got these professors that are, they don't understand, you know, they're just not, and, uh, but, but you know, I'm like, probably a lot of kids, you know, I just, uh, I just went kind of crazy when I got here, and, uh, uh, and, and then I got married when I was a sophomore, and I kind of figured out a system from then on in, we pretty much made, uh, made all A's. In fact, on my economics uh, uh, degree, I think we have all A's on there. We, we have, you know, took about every economics course that Northeastern offered at that time, and, and I think that is a four point on average, and, and it's pretty doggone close to a four point overall. Grades are really important. I know college kids don't think that. I probably didn't realize that, and maybe my wife did, and like I said, we got married when we, we was a sophomore, but uh, in, in thinking about businesses and thinking about being an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is somebody that really just doesn't want to work for somebody else. I mean, that's what it is. He wants to accomplish something. He wants to build something. He wants to have something that, 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 that he's proud of and something that he can, uh, can look back on and say, wow, I did that. Uh, you know, we just went to an election where one of the popular things is you didn't build that. Somebody else did that for you. And every entrepreneur, and, 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 you know, you can tell, uh, you know, you, back there frying chicken. It wasn't a government back there frying chicken. It wasn't a government out there cleaning that place up at midnight, you know. I mean, so the, probably the key thing about being an entrepreneur and doing something in that light is doing it yourself. And uh, I've kind of just jotted down some rules of thumb because when I talk about fishing, I have all kinds of rules of thumb that I use in fishing, whether I'm fishing tournaments trying to do a television show I'm out there fishing tournaments trying to win money. And by the way, 
being a professional tournament fisherman is a good way to make money now. I mean, when I started, back when I graduated from college, it wasn't a, a, anything you would aspire to become. But there's a lot of professional tournament fishermen out there that make six-figure incomes, a handful that make seven-figure incomes right now. Uh, many, many people have won over a million dollars tournament fishing. Uh, I've won over a million dollars tournament fishing, and I'm really not a tournament fisherman. Uh, I, stay, I fish for Chevrolet and the Chevrolet fishing team, and I guarantee them I'll fish four tournaments a year. I'm too old to fish tournaments, to be honest with you. But I fished a tournament last week in Okeechobee and won $11,000 in it, you know? So, I mean, and that was for 29th place. The winner got 125000 125000 So if you want to be a professional fisherman, that is a good uh, career option to aspire to become. But it's kind of like being a professional baseball player, an NBA, or whatever. I mean, only a very few small percentage reach that upper level. But uh, those that do are doing very well in the game right now, no doubt about it. But uh, to, to, to become an entrepreneur, to build a business, I think there's a lot of things that's important. And I kind of just jot them down as rules of thumb. And, and that's an old country boy saying. And a rule of thumb is when you're looking at something and you sort of measure it out by your thumb and you get pretty close. It can be really dead accurate. It's, a, it's kind of a rule of thumb, you know, okay, it's got to be about this wide, and you cut it, and it fits. You know, it's close, not perfect. And rules of thumb don't always work, but they'll work more often than not. It's kind of a good way to do things. And I put down number one on my list, and I know that you probably really can't talk about this around many universities anymore, but I think you've got to have a lot of faith. I think you've got to have a strong relationship with God, and I just think that's vitally, vitally important. Um, I... I uh, I'm not saying that you can't succeed in business without that close relationship with God, because a lot of people have. A lot of people do. In fact, some downright evil people succeed. They really do. Uh, there's a lot in the Bible about that. I don't really totally understand why that happened, but that happens. But I'm telling you, I would not try to operate a business. I would not try to live within a marriage. I would not try to raise kids and grandkids without a close, working, everyday relationship with my Creator. I just wouldn't do that. And, uh, and I believe that, uh, you know, and I'm not saying you have to go to church all the time. Uh, I, was, I was a drug kid. Uh, my mom and daddy drugged me to church every time they opened the church doors. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know anything else but church. And I've been dragging my kids and my grandkids. My grandson Kyle is here, and he graduates from Northeastern this semester after 40 years. <laughs> Five. <laughs> Five. Our kids go to school five years now to graduate from college. I never understood that. But uh, we need to, you know, you got a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. That's four years, right? There's no platinum out there, you know? Why does it take five years? This is not Texas A&M. You can do this in four years. I've been telling him that forever. But, uh, but we drug our kids and grandkids to church also. Uh, I think that, uh, I think that it, you know, one of the things that whether you go to church or not, if you've got a really close relationship with God, one of the things you need to, to do to be successful in life is you need to tithe. You know, very early in the Bible, God talks about giving 10% back to, to him. He actually claimed all the firstborn of the animals and the children and everything of the children of Israel. Uh, but, and, and you don't necessarily have to give your 10% to God by giving it to a church. Uh, you don't have to do that. I can tell you a lot of stories about people that give uh, millions of dollars to God that, that very little of that actually goes to the church. Uh, it, it goes to, to other things, and, and, and some of them are fascinating stories with the, uh, because of the time. I won't, won't share those with you, but tithing is, is vitally, vitally important. Uh, the first 10%, it's easy to do when you have a dollar. That's a dime. That's real easy. It's a little bit more difficult if you're making $10 million a year, and I don't make $10 million a year. I don't sell chicken. <laughs> I don't do that, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I know people that do. And, I, and those people that make $10 million, it's just as difficult for them to tie the million as if somebody making 50000 to tie $5,000. $5, I mean, it's just, but, but tithing is vitally, vitally important if you have that working relationship. Uh, I put down here uh, the word integrity. Integrity is your brand if you're an entrepreneur. It's your brand. It's what you have. Uh, I don't care if you're selling chicken, if you're doing outdoor shows for a living, if you're building computers, if you got a, the, you're working... You got to open up the local shoe store, or like Sam Walton, my buddy that is gone now, but over in, in Arkansas. I sold Sam Walton spinnerbaits. Spinnerbaits I made right here in Tahlequah when he had 13 stores. 
and Sam and Bud became good friends, and, and uh, we actually, through our travel agency, we sold them airplane tickets back before uh, they could afford to buy airplanes. And uh, Sam started over there with, uh, you know, with little stories. He, he started selling boots and stuff like that. And I've got some great Sam Walton stories. Again, well, I won't tell those, but, uh, but, but integrity. Sam Walton built what he had on integrity. It's what you have. It doesn't matter if you're selling fried chicken or if you run an outdoor show. Integrity is what you have that's unique to you. Uh, it, 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 you can, almost anything you come up with that you want to be an entrepreneur with, somebody else is already doing it. There are five or six hundred outdoor shows now. Uh, I, I don't know how involved any of you are in fishing and hunting, but most of you might be able to name three or four, and that's all. There's just a handful of really large shows. But it doesn't matter what you're doing. Your integrity is unique to you. And, and, and treat it like it's the most precious thing in the world because it is. And, and I wrote down another reel to end here. Don't lie. Don't stretch the truth. Don't embellish. Don't do anything other than just walk the straight and narrow. I mean, that is, that's the most important thing you can do in life. But let me tell you, walking the straight and narrow many, many times feels like a kick in the head. I mean, I've been there, done that. I've left deals that I just wanted to make so bad I could cry, but I knew it wasn't the right thing to do. I, I just had an opportunity the other day with a really, really large company with the Three Legends brand, with Bill Dance and, and Roland Martin, to endorse a product that's a wonderful product. They, you, you got it every auto store in the country. They got it at Walmarts and Bass Pros and all over the country. And, and I could not do it because I had a deal with a startup company, a small, and, and that deal's a good deal. That deal's a, a really nice advertising program. But, uh, but, but it, I had a conflict with a the product they're coming out. Contractually, I could have done it, but from an integrity standpoint, it would have been wrong on my part. And I didn't do it. I left that land on the table. And it, it almost makes me want to cry. It actually it probably made Bill Dance and Roland Martin cry <laughs> also. But I think they're going to go ahead and do a deal with Roland, so he's going to have something. But, but, but I could tell you lots of, lots of stories like that. Back when, back when a beer company sponsored bass tournament fishing, one of the rules that they put in in order to accumulate points and to fish the top-level tournaments, like the Bassmaster Classic, you had to wear, you had to wear a, 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 and I won't name the beer company, but it's a really big one, uh, the, you had to wear one of their patches on your tournament shirts. We wear tournament shirts that's got Chevrolet and our Ranger boats and all this stuff all over it. And uh, you had to wear that on your shirt. You had to put a decal on your boat, on your tournament boat, that, for that company. In order to qualify for the top prizes, in order to earn quite a bit of money. So it was costly if you didn't do that. And, and I, was only, I was only one of over only three fishermen on a professional level that did that. Only one. I would not do that. And, and I didn't do it from a religious standpoint. Uh, I don't believe the Bible uh, says anything about you drinking beer. I did it because of the fact that where we live here in Cherokee County, we have a lot of people killed on the roads by people that are drinking. And I didn't want to be any part of that. And, and I'd already made a decision many years before in our store out there 10 miles from town here on Lake Tenkiller. We've never sold the first can of beer out there. We've had that store forever. We made that decision when we opened that store, I don't know how long ago, 20 or 25 years ago, that we'd not sell beer. And, and a lot of the people at, at our church felt like, oh, wow, Jimmy's taking a great religious stand. It was not a religious stand. And, we had a lot written about us in, in a lot of the big religious magazines around the country because they sort of thought it was, and I kept telling them it wasn't. I just didn't want somebody to get that last can of beer, that last six-pack that put them over the edge and cause them to go down the street down there on our curvy roads out there around the lake and run into somebody and kill them. I mean, that, that was why. And, and the beer companies kept trying to sell me beer. We had a big old store, the biggest one on the lake, and they kept saying, Jimmy, and, and they told me this, it's costing you $40,000 a year profit to not sell beer in that store. $40,000 a year profit. Now, you know, I'm a businessman. It's real easy for me to understand. That's, that's, you don't want to lose $40,000. But I took a stand on what I believed. And it was not a religious stand. It was a, what I felt like a moral stand that might save somebody's life. Somebody that's a little bit drunk might make it home and not kill somebody because they couldn't stop by. And we had customers get mad at us. This is the lake. We come to the lake to have a good time, and we can't even buy beer here. We had some customers that wouldn't even shop with us because of that. And uh, so, so it was easy for me to turn that beer patch down. But, but don't lose your integrity. Don't lose your integrity. 
I got a whole lot of other rules of thumb, and I, I run out of time a lot quicker than, 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 uh, than a lot of people, but let me just run through a few of these. I'm not going to embellish too many of them. They're just things that you think about if you want to be in business for yourself and if you want to build a business. Uh, right at the top, I've got that you need to set aside a regular amount of percentage for marketing. I'm in the promotional business. That's what I do with an outdoor television show. And let me tell you, marketing is the key to success in an entrepreneurship. You need to set aside money from day one to do that. You, you, I mean, it costs money to do it. If you don't do it, if you don't market, you're just going to go out of business. That's just all there is to it. Um, I wrote a little note down here. My buddy Forrest Wood that started Ranger Boat Company 45 years ago, 45 years ago this year. And I actually had the very first Ranger boat in the state of Oklahoma, and they still are one of our largest sponsors to this day. I was told, and I don't know if this is dead accurate or not, because Forrest is not the one that told me this, and I never asked him about it. I was told that back in, in, in from, not from the very first day, but for the, close to the inception, that Forrest Wood set aside $500 per boat to use for marketing. They, the best boat promoter I've ever seen in the world is Ranger Boat Company and Tracker Marine, and I work for both of them. $500 per boat. Now, he didn't know exactly how he was going to use that money, but he had that set aside. Anytime I've ever asked him for something from a marketing standpoint, I would lay it out to him over the years, and, and he doesn't own the company anymore, but his son-in-law does run the company. He would look at it, and he said, Jimmy, I think that's a good idea. We can do it. He never, ever said, I need to check the budget, or I need to talk to our marketing people and see if we've got that in the budget. And the reason was, he always had it in the budget. Because, you know, when you're selling one or two boats a day, or, or, and, but now, you know, they're selling like 60 boats a day, that's a lot of money for marketing. And a lot of money for marketing. You also need to, side, to set aside money to save and invest in your business. One of the biggest mistakes, and I've heard lecturers and read in books about people about plowing money back into the business. Every businessman wants to do that. Take everything you can, deprive yourself, deprive your family, put that money back in, grow the business. That's not a bad principle, but let me tell you, of everything you make, you need to set aside some and save it and invest it. And I think you need to be invested in it. Now, we don't have great investments in this country right now, but I think you need to be invested in it. And I, I believe that because things are going to be bad at times in business, and you better have something to get you through. You just got to have that. I started buying stock <laughs> in the stock market back when the Exxon Valdez, we've got to be some of us older folks to know, the Exxon Valdez was a big ship that, uh, that ran aground up in Alaska that Exxon owned as before Exxon Mobil. Exxon owned that. Largest corporation in America at that time. And you know, gas prices now, they may be again the largest, I don't know. But, uh, and they spilled all this oil out, and they were being sued for m tons of money, and they were going out of business, and their stock price went way down. And I thought, man, I need to get in the stock market. I'm going to start investing. And I, and I actually built up hundreds of thousands of dollars of Exxon stock. And, and we, we bought that stock and did a dividend reinvestment plan where every quarter when they spit these dividends out, I just got more and more stock. And I kept putting money in it. And, uh, and, and then we started investing in other things, but we... We use money from the business as opposed to using it for ourselves or to plow back into the business for investments. The year 2008 come along, and I don't know what people think of the economy, but let me tell you, we are still in a bad situation economy-wise in this country. This recession that we're in, this downturn, whatever you want to call it, is 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, six years, six years. Never have I seen anything in my life like that. Probably none of y'all have seen anything in your life like that. The younger kids sure enough haven't. I mean, and when that happens, it's really, really difficult for businesses to stay in business. We lost money both in the television show business and in the marine business, the boat business. We lost money in 2008, 2009, 2010. We made money a little bit in 2011. Uh, not much. <laughs> we made a little money in 2012. Our fiscal year ends in June. We're going to have a good profit in fiscal year 2013. But, uh, but in, in 2009, and, and, I, and we're a small business, in 2009, our businesses lost in excess of $600,000. Great business. I want to be an entrepreneur. That sounds like fun, Jimmy. <laughs> I'm getting out of this class. I'm going to go get me a job somewhere else. We lost $600,000.
in excess of that that year in the, in the television show business and the boat business. And we had some businesses that made money. <laughs> had I not had that savings and investment, we're out of business. Everything's gone. So it's vital. Rainy days are going to be there. You've got to do that. You've got to do that. Set aside money that when those bad things happen, had we not done that, it's, it's horrible losing that kind of money. But it's worse if you lose that and you ain't got it to lose because you're out of business. You're out of business. You're out there working for somebody else, and you don't want to be that. You don't want to do that. You know, you already get, you got, okay, you got a wife you're working for. You don't need to be working for anybody else. You know, that's the way it makes. Use your name in your business any time anytime you can. Charlie's Chicken, you know. You put it in there. You know, when we first started our television show, we called it Bass Fish in America. A guy that, a guy that I uh, uh, hired to produce the show, uh, he came up with this great name, had a great logo, and, and we did that for a year, and I went to this big show, and everybody's talking about how great that, that new television show was. And I said, well, I'm the guy at host that. Yeah, what's your name? And I thought, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I told the guy, I said, we got to change the name of this show. And he fought me and fought me, and so I fired him, <laughs> produced it myself, bought my own camera equipment and stuff, called it Jimmy Houston Outdoors, yeah? And, uh, and, and so now they know who it is. And the two guys that I tried to emulate a lot when I started was Roland Martin and Bill Dance. They both got their name in there. So put your name in your business if possible. I know if it's, uh, it, it, it's AAAA roofing that you're going to be first in the, in the phone book. But Sam Jones roofing will be better. And then you build that integrity on that Sam Jones name. That's what you do. Now, if you're going to put your name in there, you better watch what you're doing. Everybody's got a camera in their pocket. <laughs> be careful what you're doing because you can destroy that integrity in a heartbeat. Uh, I've got a formula that I learned right when I was here at Northeastern back in the early days in, in some of my economics class. Uh, it's called the KISS formula. I think um, it's called keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. I don't care what you're doing. The people out there in this world are not very smart. They are not. Keep it simple. I don't care how intelligent you are. I don't care how smart you become. I, I have no idea how these telephones I can be in Africa on a bow hunting trip and shoot an animal, take a picture with it, and send it to my buddies in Oklahoma. I don't know how that works. Somebody's really, really smart to figure that out. The professional guy, the hunter, hadn't even come out and picked me up in the woods, and I'm in Africa taking a picture of a big animal and sending it to all my friends in the United States. I don't know how that works, but it, it, it don't matter how smart you get. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Always try to stack the odds in your favor. Whatever you're doing, think about stacking the odds in your favor. There are going to be things you want to do really, really bad. It looks like they've got a real upside to them. But if you can't st stack the odds in your favor, don't do them. It's like doing television shows. I get letters. We get about 20,000 letters a year on our television show. And uh, only all but about one or two of them are positive. I got a negative one this week. I ain't even going to answer the guy. <laughs> but, uh, but, but nearly all of them are positive. But these guys are always telling me, Jimmy, why don't you come up here to, to, to Indiana? And I try not to fish in states that start with an I, by the way. Uh, but, but come up here to Indiana. I've got this lake we live on. We fish here all the time. We never catch anything. Come up here and do a television show and teach us how to catch fish on this lake. I ain't interested in going something where I can't catch them. I want to go where they're biting. You know, I'm going to Sugar Lake in Mexico this next week to fish. It's the greatest lake in the world. That's where I want to go to fish. Stack, stack the odds in your favor, no matter what you're doing. I want to go somewhere where they're biting. If they're not biting there, I'll cancel that and go somewhere else. I mean, no matter what you do, stack the odds in your favor. In everything you do, you need to try to make a win-win situation for everybody involved. That's really, really difficult to do. It sounds easy, but... It's difficult for we're thinking about our little part of the equation. We're trying to win whatever we do. In other words, we're thinking about, okay, here's my little part. I'm the manufacturer. And so I need to, you know, worry about the manufacturing costs and help and all this business. And I need to put a profit on here and I make a profit. But let me tell you, it, the manufacturer's got to win in the equation. The distributor that's buying that product's got to win. The retailer's got to win. Whoever's promoting that product, if it's me or whatever, whoever's promoting it's got to win, and a customer's got to win. Anything you do, everybody's got to win. So what you have to do, wherever you fall in that equation, 
is you got to put yourself in everybody else's shoes when you start making your deals. Uh, you know, if, if uh, and you got to make sure, because if anybody loses along that line, quite likely you will not succeed, no matter where you are in this. If you're the manufacturer, if you're the distributor, if you're the rep, you're the promoter, two people really have to succeed or everybody fails. One's a manufacturer. They don't make a profit on whatever they're doing. If you don't make a profit, you got to shut those stores down. Say, I love to eat there. Why do you close? You wouldn't make any money. You got to make a profit. So the manufacturer has to win. The customer has to win. He's got to. Because if he doesn't win, people are going to go say, I don't, I'm not going there. Charlie's, the buffet sucks. You know, I mean, it was terrible. I went over to get the gravy and it had two chicken gizzards in it. You know, so he's out there picking the chicken gizzards up. So, you know, the customer's got to be happy. He's got to tell his people, well, I love that product. How I first heard out about Walmart, this is a, you know, and I, I got a lot of Walmart stories, and we still work really, really closely with Walmart. I've got a meeting this next Friday night, a dinner meeting with a head tackle buyer at Walmart in Tulsa. And uh, I work with Walmart a lot. But, uh, you know, back in those, uh, ba back in those early, early days of, of Walmart, when I first heard of Walmart, a friend of mine here in Tahlequah told me, he said, well, I was over there in Rogers, Arkansas, and they got this big store over there. And the prices were incredible, and they had all this stuff. I went back there and bought me a pair of hunting boots. They had so many hunting boots, I couldn't believe it. And I said, what's the name of the store? He said, Walmart. And I said, wow, that's something. This was like the very first number one store in Rogers, Arkansas. Yeah. And so the customer was out there selling to Sam Walton, this buddy of mine here in Tahlequah that I was selling insurance with. Yeah. First, how I first heard about Walmart. And look what it's built into, over 3,000 stores, largest retailer in the world, in the world. And uh, it's amazing what they do. I mean, I, I'm inside of some of their operations, and the numbers just blow you away. You know what their number one seller is, by the way? It's not eggs. <laughs> coffee. Isn't that amazing? Sell more coffee than they do uh, soft drinks. I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that. But everybody's got to win. So when you want to make a deal, consider everybody else in a deal. Look at their side of the equation, too. And, that, and that's the way you can make that win. Uh, you got to outwork everybody. I mean, that's just the deal in entrepreneur. And I believe that at my rule of thumb is you got to be the first person there at your business. You got to be the last person to leave. I don't want an employee showing up and I'm not there working. I don't want them working three hours late, which our people do a lot, and lock the door. I'm going to lock that door. I'm going to be the last one there. You also got to outwork your competition. Fortunately, in this day and time, that's getting easier and easier to do. It really is. A lot of people out there don't want to work. Now, I know that the, the bright thing in wanting to be own your own business and run your own business is you see these guys, you know, jetting off to the Bahamas for a week or going on cruises and driving these big $65,000 bass boats. Can you imagine bass boats, $65,000? That's what they cost. The motor alone is twenty grand on a bass boat. It's crazy. It's crazy. You say, well, I, I want to run my business and do one of those. Let me tell you, that guy that's doing that, he's been the first in, the last out for years and years to get to that point where he can do that. But that's one of the beautiful parts about, about being an entrepreneur and, and, and doing, running your own business. You, you, can, you can get to that point. Uh, in, in, uh, talking about outworking your competition, don't ever say anything bad about your competition. That's one of the easiest things for somebody to do in business is talk badly about their competition. Don't do that. Don't do that. I don't care how bad they are. I don't care how they lie, cheat, or steal. Don't do that. Somebody brings up the competition and say, you know, I really don't tell them too much. Like, you know, like I represent Ranger boats and Tracker boats. Ranger on fiberglass, Tracker on aluminum. A lot of boats out there. Probably pretty good boats. I don't know. I never, ever, ever say anything bad about anybody else's boat. Somebody asked me about another brand, I'll just tell them, you know, I, you know, I, I guess it's a pretty good boat. I fish out of a Ranger. Uh, I'm sure that boat's a good boat. Here's why I do this. You know, and then I go right back to selling what I'm in paid to sell. And you need to do that. Don't ever say anything bad about your competition. Don't let, don't let your employees, don't let your employees do, it, do, do those things either. Don't, don't, let them, don't, tell, don't let them lie. Don't let them embellish. Don't let them say something bad about your competition. One of the key things in business, you've heard, and it's an old axiom, it's an old tale that you hear when you're a kid, it's not important what you know, it's important who you know. Well, that's a bunch of bunk. It is important who knows you. You know, I mean, 
if, if they don't know you, it don't help that you know them. It's important that they know you. I was sitting in a Ranger dealer conference one time when we had all these two, 300 Ranger dealers out there, and Lee Scott, who was at that time CEO and president of Walmart, was up giving a talk and talking about the economy and the gas prices. Gas was up to all about two bucks a gallon then, and, uh, and talking about how one cent a gallon affected their business inside of Walmart. And now, in one cent, don't mean nothing. It's like 10 cents probably to affect it. But, but he was talking, and he told this story about buying a boat in Rogers, Arkansas. And he told about going into these boat dealerships, and of course, they didn't know who he was. And, and at one time, we owned six boat dealerships. We were the largest Ranger boat dealer in the world. We sold hundreds of boats every year, every month. And uh, he went into this boat dealership, and, and, and how they wouldn't, nobody came out and waited on him, nobody took care of him. Nobody paid any attention to him. Now, if he had walked in there and said, <clears throat> I'm the president of Walmart, boom, everybody would come over and took care of him. He walked in there, just fishing close, trying to buy a boat. He said he fooled around 15, 20 minutes, and nobody paid any attention to him. He went out and got in his car, went down the street to Jimmy Houston Marine. He said he walked in there, and the people run out there and started taking care of him and helping him, and he bought a boat from him. He said, I understand Jimmy's in the crowd. <laughs> And he said, I want to thank you for what your people did down there. I'm thinking, woo -hoo! Lee Scott knows me. <laughs> and I thought right then, that's one of my rules of thumb. It's not important who you know. I didn't know Lee Scott. I didn't know him now. <laughs> I went up and made sure I knew him. But, uh, but he knew me. See, that's the important thing. So make sure of that. I really believe, you know, as fishermen, Jeff Foxworthy tells this old joke about that kid's going to grow up with a job with a name on his shirt like Bill's Garage or something, you know. Every shirt I got's got my name on it. You know, but I laugh at all of Jeff's jokes. I mean, I'm a redneck, so. I'm a redneck and I'm a Baptist. I mean, we're the butt of most, we're about the only one people that anybody can make fun of anymore. <laughs> if you're both, <laughs> we just laugh at all those jokes. They make a Baptist joke or a redneck joke, you know, we're there. But uh, in fact, if I was like King, like Obama thinks he is, if I was King, I'd make a rule that everybody had to wear their name on their shirt. So when you're walking across campus, you walk over and you say, hey, Bill, how's it going today? It's going good, Jimmy. You know, instead of everybody walking around, you know. And in New York City, it'd be really cool because you'd know who was cussing you out, you know. <laughs> no, it's honking a horn behind you, you know. It's terrible. But, but anyway, who you know is really possible. And you want to build relationships. You want to build relationships. Uh, probably the biggest mistake that I made early in my fishing career was I built, relation and, and I built relationships with outdoor riders. And uh, when I would go to tournaments, I wouldn't be concerned with winning tournaments. When I qualified for the Bassmaster Classic, which I did a whole lot of times, uh, I would go there not really caring about winning the tournament, but building relationships with these outdoor riders because they could help me. And... Uh, at, and I thought that was what I needed to be doing, and that was good. I mean, that was not a bad thing, but, but I've learned over the last several years that what I needed to be doing and what I do for a living is building relationships with buyers at places like Walmart, Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's, Academy, Dick's, all these places. And let me tell you, I, over the last several years, I've really gone out of my way and spent hundreds of hours and lots of trips and everything building relationships. In the last six months, I've been in all of those places we're talking about, all of them, setting down and building relationships with, with the individuals, and I build them all the way. I mean, I, every buyer I can do it with. So build relationships with people that are key in whatever entrepreneur, whatever type of building you, you, try, to, uh, you try to build. Uh, everybody talks about price. I mentioned Walmart over there, and, and my buddy told me you can't believe the prices they got on that thing. Do not be too concerned about price. Sell value. Value is far, 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 far more important than price. Uh, sometimes you can raise the price and things sell better. It really does. I've seen it happen. But uh, the two most expensive outdoor shows in the nation to buy out of five or 600, Jimmy Houston and Bill Dan. And I'm reminded of that constantly when we try to sell advertising. Now, it doesn't bother me a bit. I just look them right in the eye and tell them it ought to be the most expensive show out there. It's, those are the best places to spend your advertising money in the outdoor marketplace. I'd be insulted if we were not the most expensive show out there. So sell value, not price. I got down here, be nice and smile. That sounds really easy, doesn't it? Golly, that's the easiest thing in the world. It costs no money to be nice to people, nothing. 
I had one of my partners at the tournament we just fished last week. We came off the stage, and I had a lot of kids and a lot of people out there, and I was signing autographs and taking pictures with people. And again, it's a fishing crowd, so you got a lot of fans. And, and I did that for about an hour. I got back down to the boat finally, and my partner said, man, I can't believe how nice you are to everybody. He said, you took an hour after we've been out there working hard all day. You've got to get ready for tomorrow. And you took an hour and spent all that time with all those people. And I just looked at him and said, it don't cost any money to be nice. It don't cost any money to be nice. Be that way. Smile all the time. People are going to wonder what you're up to. Yeah, yeah. Study your competition. Know what your competition's doing. Treat everybody special that you meet because, by golly, they are. By golly, they are. Every person you meet special. You know, we got thousands of people in prison here in Oklahoma. Those people have done all kinds of terrible, terrible things. They got mamas and daddies and brothers and sisters that just love them to death. Everybody's special. So treat everybody special because, by golly, they are. Be letter perfect. One of the, one of the things that gets me to in this day and age, we, we, we live on these things right here. We talk about the kids being a silent generation. I call my son Kyle, my grandson Kyle, call him on the phone. He texts me back. I text him back, answer the phone. I'm calling you. I want to talk to you. We call those kids the silent generation. We're just as bad guys. We've, we've, they've sucked us in. We're there. I send 10 million emails and texts. I mean, it's just amazing, you know. You talk to eight or 10 people at the same time. B letter perfect. There was an old gal named Leona Helsney. She got sent in prison. She was one of those evil people that was successful. She got sent to prison, you know, for cheating on her income taxes. And uh, I thought, how so she was kind of my hero. <laughs> but uh, but she, she did these deals about letters she sent to customers. One of the things that we are losing in this country is communication skills. Learn how to speak. Learn how to write letters. Do not write those stinking texts and put a U down for you. Y-O-U. Two is T-W-O or T-O-O. It's not two. Don't do all that stuff. When you send a text, you go back there and you read, you, you read, you read the text on my deals. Every one of them is grammatically perfect as I can get it. I've not been the world's greatest speller, but this corrects me. And, and well, let me tell you, a lot of times it says the wrong word. So you better read those things before you punch that send button. But be letter perfect. When you write a letter to somebody in your business or you send a text or an email, Go back and look at that thing. Make sure you're grammatically correct. I never liked English courses. I never liked those at all. I'm like any kid. But let me tell you the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I'm just tickled to death that I learned all of that. You know, I love the exciting things in college. I didn't like those things like the English courses, you know. Be accessible to, you, to, to, to your people. Be accessible to your employees. Be accessible to your customers. Be accessible to everybody. Again, that sounds easy. In this day and time, it's very, very difficult. Somebody to take the time to send you a text or call you on a phone, call them back. I don't care who you are. Call them back. Build communication skills. You know, I started taking speech classes when I'm in college. I'm not a great speaker yet today, but I like to do it. It's fun. I like to get up and talk. Um, and be positive in everything that you do. I'm telling you, uh, that old deal about the glass is half full, it's not half empty, it is. I mean, that's the deal. Don't complain. We have got a generation, a whole bunch of complainers. The young bass fishermen are fishing tournaments. These guys are fishing for a living, and all they do is gripe and complain about something that's wrong. Don't complain. When I was a little bitty kid, I was griping about something. My daddy told me, and daddies are the greatest people in the world because they, they teach you things all the time. Well, granddaddies are better than daddies. I say. Grandma and granddad are the best people in the world. You all, all know that. You all know that. <laughs> But my daddy told me one time, he said, son, he said, quit griping and complaining. I said, well, it's just something, you know, something wrong. And he said, let me tell you, he said, half the people that you're complaining to don't care. The other half are glad you have a problem. So don't complain. Don't complain. And never give up. How many times y'all want to give up in the chicken business? Almost daily, probably. I mean, that's just part of being in business. Don't give up. Never give up. You know, never give up. I got a, one of the deals on my phone I look at all the time. It shows this frog. And half of this frog is down in the mouth of this big old bird. And he's got the bird around the neck, squeezing him, you know. And the sign says, never give up. <laughs> he's half eaten. He's still trying to kill that bird. Get out of his mouth, you know. Never give up. And the last thing I've got down here is, is spend as much time as you can 
studying great leaders. Study great leaders. Find out why, why they made it. You know, and see, some of y'all came here, you know, because hoping to learn some little something that might help you be successful in your business career. Uh, I've got a, a, a book that I keep on my desk that I read all the time. I don't know how long I've had it, 30 years probably. It's called The Leadership Lessons of Jesus. I'm not even sure you can still buy it. It's a little thin book. I got another little book that says God's Wisdom for Business People, and it's nothing but Scripture. The, the Leadership Lessons of Jesus is stories, telling stories about, you know, how the stories of things that Jesus did when he walked the earth and how that applied to my business and your business and everybody else's business. But study those great leaders. Buy those books. Read them. Don't, don't, you know, don't just go through I mean, immerse yourself in, I mean, we've had, we've had right here in the state of Oklahoma and Arkansas around, we've had some of the most incredible leaders in the world. I worked for companies that were started by one individual that are selling $2 billion worth of products now, seven, 8,000 employees. And you go back and look, and one guy started that. East Penn Manufacturing built batteries. I, I do their Duracell Marine battery and their DECA industrial batteries, what I promote. They make all the batteries for Bass Pro Shop, all the batteries for Sears Die Hard. They make all the batteries for O'Reilly, AutoZone, on and on. I mean, and, and you know, just amazing. And, and, and one guy started that. One guy started that over near Hershey, Pennsylvania. So, uh, you know, study those guys. Find out what they believe. And what you'll find out about almost all of them, how in the world do you become successful making a battery? You know, think about that. It doesn't matter. It's what they do up here. It's how they treat people. It's their attitude. It's just the way they go about what they do. And all of those great leaders, it'll be stimulus. So study those guys. Immerse yourself in their beliefs. And then live that way. Live that way. I know I probably run over my time. I apologize for that. Not unusual. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's wonderful to get to come back here.